Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sakshi Rora Hans, your OBGY faculty at Maro. And uh, today I am here to discuss with you all the questions which were asked in OBGY in INI SET May 2022. Now, as expected, your questions were not that easy, rather they were tough and they were based on various updates. So many questions were related to updates which had recently come. They were also direct questions which were asked from Tables of Williams. Now, in NEET PG 2022 and in INI SET, which happened in May 2022, PIH was a very important topic. On PIH, in NEET, there were three to four questions and in INI SET, there were two questions. So, for all of you, whether you are appearing for uh, INI SET, whether you are appearing for NEET or for FMG, PIH becomes a very important topic. And yes, uh, questions definitely were concept-based. So, let's see what the questions were. Number one, a 25-year-old lady had uneventful vaginal delivery. On postpartum day one, she presented with postpartum hemorrhage and complaints of visual changes and severe headache. So, your patient is undergoing vaginal delivery and she has postpartum hemorrhage. And then, she also has visual changes and headache. A few hours after the complain she's found to be in an unresponsive state and is intubated and put on ventilation on further examination she you can see she's in shock bp is 60 by 40 tachycardia is there and there is hypoglycemia that's a very particular finding which you are getting a peculiar finding hematocrit and wbc count was normal which of the following drugs would help to reverse this state now these days, the trend is that you are being asked questions on postpartum collapse. Normally, when they ask you questions on postpartum collapse, you are, uh, you know, expected to differentiate between PPH, between amniotic fluid embolism and uterine inversion. In NEAT PG also, there was a question on postpartum collapse and this topic in detail where I have helped you in differentiating between these three conditions I have told you in detail in the neat recall which is going to follow this. Now over here the important thing which you have to keep over here in mind is the peculiar symptoms and the peculiar findings which you are getting. Number one they are saying your patient had PPH and she has visual changes and headache. That's a very peculiar symptom to get. Along with this your patient is in shock and there is hypoglycemia and I know you people have studied medicine much more than than what I have studied and you know from your medicine knowledge that they are talking about pituitary apoplexy. So, uh, what happens during pregnancy is that the pituitary gland enlarges and it enlarges by 125%. That means it is more than doubling in size and automatically if the uh, pituitary gland is doubling in size during pregnancy, it needs more blood supply also. So, if after delivery a female is having PP the blood supply to the pituitary will decrease and because blood supply to the pituitary would decrease that is why there are increased chances of ischemia of the pituitary gland and why is this ischemia happening this is because the size of the pituitary gland is increasing by 125 percent so if they have to ask you a single liner question in neat this could be one of the questions that what happens to the size of the pituitary gland it increases by 125 percent i also want all of you to remember here that the size of the spleen also increases in pregnancy and the size of spleen increases by 50 percent so coming back to our question our question is saying that a uh, patient had postpartum hemorrhage. Now, whenever your patient is going to have postpartum hemorrhage, severe postpartum hemorrhage that all of you know can result in necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland and that is what is called as Sheehan syndrome. Now, in Sheehan syndrome, this Sheehan syndrome could be mild, it could be moderate or it could be severe. That is one thing which could happen. Second thing could be that there are females who have unnoticed micro or a macro adenoma. So, they have a, an adenoma of the pituitary gland which is unnoticed, which they didn't know was existing. Now, when a PPH happens, maybe, you know, there is ischemic infarction 
of the pituitary gland which has an unnoticed adenoma so that can result in pituitary apoplexy so pituitary apoplexy is one of the medical emergencies to happen this pituitary apoplexy one of the risk factors for a pituitary apoplexy is definitely pph and then you know you can either say that pituitary apoplexy is also you know the severe form of sheehan syndrome sheehan syndrome when it is happening in its severe forms can also result in pituitary apoplexy another very important questions which is not related to obgy but they ask you is what are the risk factors for pituitary apoplexy one of them as i told you is pph other than that it could be diabetes hypertension sickle cell anemia and acute shock all of this can result in pituitary apoplexy now what happens in sheehan syndrome in sheehan syndrome you know that there is necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland and because there is going to be necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland all the hormones which are formed by the pituitary gland anterior pituitary gland are going to decrease the most important uh, is that which is the first hormone to decrease in sheehan syndrome the first hormone to decrease in sheehan syndrome is growth hormone again that's a very very important question then after growth hormone it's prolactin hormone lh fsh acth and t sh now because you know the growth hormone is decreasing prolactin is decreasing one of the manifestations rather if they ask you what is the most common presenting symptom of a patient with sheehan syndrome it is failure to lactate this patient who has just now undergone vaginal delivery and had pph she will not be able to lactate her baby so she is going to give you history of failure of lactation this is very important for you to remember that the most common presenting symptom term of sheehan syndrome is failure to lactate but on the other hand if they ask you what is the most common presenting symptom of a prolactinoma then please don't say it is uh, galactoria galactoria is not the most common symptom of a prolactinoma the most common symptom of a prolactinoma is amenorrhea right so it's not galactoria now coming back to my sheehan syndrome in sheehan syndrome the most common presenting symptom is going to be failure to lactate and the second most common symptom is going to be secondary amenorrhea although you know we expect that if a female has just delivered she is not going to menstruate but if a female is not lactating normally her menstrual uh, menstruation returns by 6 to 8 weeks but in this particular female there is going to be persistent amenorrhea secondary amenorrhea beyond Six to eight weeks as well. Then there is going to be mild fatigue and anorexia. So these are the symptoms with which a patient of Sheehan syndrome comes to us. Now this is what happens in mild Sheehan syndrome and moderate Sheehan syndrome. When we are talking about severe Sheehan syndrome, then there is going to be shock. And why is there going to be shock? This is because the levels of ACTH decrease. And when the levels of ACTH are going to decrease, the levels of aldosterone are going to decrease the levels of corticosteroids are going to decrease and your patient is going to develop shock and that becomes an emergency condition which is called as pituitary apoplexy right so in case of pituitary apoplexy also all the hormones which are formed by the pituitary are going to decrease and in case of pituitary apoplexy since they have a an unnoticed uh, adenoma they can present to you with headaches they have visual disturbances they the patient presents to you with shock and there is hypoglycemia so whenever you have a question which says that patient has pph and post pph she is presenting to you with headache with visual disturbances with shock and hypoglycemia you should think always about pituitary apoplexy a better answer is pituitary apoplexy rather than saying it's a case of sheehan syndrome if pituitary apoplexy is not given then you are going to say it's a case of sheehan syndrome right now so if i ask you what is the mainstay of management of pituitary apoplexy or a mainstay of management of a patient of sheehan syndrome who has developed shock that is corticosteroids so whenever you have a patient of sheehan syndrome you know before you think about any other treatment always think about giving her corticosteroid because we know that as the sheehan syndrome is going to progress her acth levels are going to decrease and eventually your patient is going to be in shock right 
right? So always in a case of Sheehan syndrome and in case of pituitary apoplexy, the mainstay of treatment is corticosteroid. So over here, the answer is going to be steroids. So I have told you just now, most common presenting symptom of Sheehan syndrome, always it is failure to lactate. In case of pituitary apoplexy, you are going to get headache, visual disturbances, you are going to get hypoglycemia and your patient will be in shock. In case of prolactinoma, please do not say that the presenting symptom is galactoria. In case of prolactinoma, the presenting symptom is amenorrhea or infertility. Right? Clear to all of you? Coming to the next question. Next question is, all are true about biophysical score or biophysical profile except. Now, again, the, in your NEAT also, there was a question which was asked on NST and biophysical profile. Before I start discussing you details about biophysical profile, you should understand that whenever a patient comes to you, a pregnant female, whenever she comes to you with decreased fetal movements, Right. Then the screening test which you do is a modified biophysical score. Modified biophysical score and biophysical score are two different things. In a modified biophysical score, you are going to look at only two parameters. What are those two parameters? You look at amniotic fluid index and NST. And that was also a question which was asked in your INI set exam. Modified biophysical score includes, and the options given were, option A, NST and fetal tone, option B, NST and AFI. So, uh, the answer is NST and AFI. And if any of these parameters is abnormal in a modified biophysical score, if any of this is abnormal, then you have to go for the diagnostic test and the diagnostic test becomes a biophysical score. Right Now, uh, whenever a patient comes to you with decreased fetal movement, as I told you, the first investigation which you should be doing or the screening test which you should be doing is a modified biophysical score. But sometimes in your options, modified biophysical score is not given. In that case, you are going, the second best answer will be, you are going to say, I am going to do an NST. Right. And if NST comes out to be abnormal, then again, it has to be followed by a complete biophysical score. A complete biophysical score is also called as Manning score. And that is a confirmatory test, right, for fetal distress, fetal asphyxias and fetal acidemias, right. Although in a biophysical score, just now I'm going to tell you what is a biophysical score and, you know, how do you correlate the score with fetal condition, but always remember that an abnormal biophysical score means that there is fetal asphyxia, right? So, your question which they had asked was, all are true about biophysical score except it includes breathing, movement, tone and amniotic fluid volume. I am sure you know what are the parameters which are included in a biophysical score. In a biophysical score, there are five parameters which are included and they are TB, meningitis, always notorious, where T stands for fetal tone. And this biophysical score, it has to be done under ultrasound and for 30 minutes, you are going to observe the fetus. In a period of 30 minutes, if you are getting one or more than one movement of extension and limb extension and limb flexion, then you give a score of plus two. Right. So then you give a score of plus two. Then the second parameter which you're going to note is the fetal breathing movement. In a period of 30 minutes, if you are getting one episode of fetal breathing, which is actually not breathing, which is a chest wall movement, which is happening for at least 30 seconds, then also you give a score of plus two. Then third thing which you have to see is the gross body movement. In a period of 30 minutes, there has to be at least three movements in the fetus. If you are getting three movements, you're going to give a score of plus two, then you have to look at the single largest vertical pocket. Please remember, in modified biophysical score also, I was looking at the amniotic fluid and in a biophysical score also, I'm looking at the amniotic fluid. But in case of modified biophysical score, we were checking the parameter which we were looking at was amniotic fluid index. In case of biophysical score, the parameter which we look at is the single largest vertical pocket. Always remember, between single largest vertical pocket, which is also called as single deepest pocket, 
and between AFI. The more sensitive parameter always is the single largest vertical pocket. So if the, you are getting a, at least a 2 centimeter pocket, which is 2 into 2 centimeter, then you are going to give a score of plus 2. And if you are getting 2 or more than 2 accelerations in a period of 20 to 40 minutes, then you get give a score of plus 2. If any of these things is absent or it is less than what I have told you just now, then you give a score of 0. There is nothing in between. Either you have to give a score of 0 or you have to give a score of plus 2. So the maximum score which I can get is 10 by 10. So if you are getting a score of 10 by 10 or if you are getting a score of 8 by 10 but the amniotic fluid volume is normal. So this parameter over here is normal. Then in that case, that means the fetus is absolutely fine. Now, always remember that these tests, that is NST and biophysical score, they are not just done for fetal distress. They are also used as tools for fetal monitoring, for antepartum fetal monitoring in high-risk pregnancies. And the interval for doing NST or biophysical score generally is weekly intervals, unless and until you are dealing with a very, very high-risk pregnancy, for example, example, if you are dealing with severe preeclampsia or if you are dealing with uh, HELP syndrome, in all those conditions, you might have to do uh, NST and biophysical score either twice weekly or you might even have to do in some conditions daily NST and biophysical score. So if you are getting a score of 10 by 10 or if you are getting a score of 8 by 10 with normal amniotic fluid volume, you don't have to do anything. That means the fetus is normal and you are going to repeat these tests weekly. Right, But if you are getting a score of 6 by 10 and in this also there is a catch. If you are getting a score of 6 by 10 with normal amniotic fluid volume, then that's an equivocal result. And in this kind of an equivocal result, I am going to look at the gestational age of the fetus. If gestational age of the fetus is less than 37 weeks, then I'm going to repeat biophysical score in 24 hours. Right. And if the biophysical, if the, uh, you know, the gestational age is more than equal to 37 weeks, then I'm going to deliver my patient. Now, suppose the score is 8 by 10 or the score is 6 by 10. But the problem is that amniotic fluid volume is decreased. Over here, you are giving zero to this parameter. This parameter is coming out to be zero. In that case, even though the score may be 8 by 10 or the score may be 6 by 10, you have to deliver the fetus if fetus is more than equal to 36 weeks. Now, if score comes out to be 4 by 10, then delivery is done at 32 weeks. And if score comes as 0 by 10 or 2 by 10, then you have to go for immediate termination of pregnancy because that means you are almost certain of fetal asphyxia and significant fetal acidemia. A normal biophysical score, which is 8 or 10, it means the, the pH of the fetus is normal. If score is coming out as 0, 2 or 4, then that is associated with fetal acidemia. As I told you, a score of 6 means equivocal. So that means that biophysical score is indirectly telling me about fetal pH also. Although the sensitivity of biophysical score to predict cord blood pH is low, but then definitely it is telling me about fetal pH as well. Right? So with this background, look at the options which were given to you. So number 1 was it includes breathing, movement, tone and amniotic fluid volume. Yes. It can tell us about fetal outcome and fetal pH. Yes. Score is inconsistent with fetal pH at different gestational age. No. If score is less than 4, fetal pH is less than 7.2 or if the score is 0, that means there is 100% fetal acidemia. Yes. So if score is less than 4, that means we are sure about fetal acidemia. Clear to all of you? Yes, now coming to another very important question which was asked and this was about SLE during pregnancy. Now, uh, you know, so many times it might happen that a topic, a question is asked from a topic for which you are not prepared. But then what they are testing over here is your overall common sense, is your overall pharmacology knowledge as well. If you will read this MCQ, at least you will know the answer, which one is the incorrect answer. You will know that. So let's read these options first and then I'm going to talk to you about SLE in pregnancy. Immunosuppression can be continued during pregnancy. We don't know much about that. Okay, let me see. 
I'll see the other options and then I'll decide. Pregnancy to be planned once the disease has been quiescent for at least six months and there is no evidence of renal dysfunction. That seems likely to be true. High dose corticosteroids for lupus flare in pregnancy safe. Plus minus, I'm not very sure about that. Ecosprin, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, corticosteroids, azathioprine are safe in pregnancy. Do you think methotrexate is safe in pregnancy? No, we never use methotrexate during pregnancy, right? So definitely this option is incorrect. Ecosprin is safe. Corticosteroids are given during pregnancy. Methotrexate, 100% I know, is not given. You all know methotrexate is not given. Cyclophosphamide is not given during pregnancy. So even if I don't know anything about SLE in pregnancy, you have a sound pharmacology knowledge. So based on that, you could have very easily answered this question. Right, so answer we know it is option D. Let us talk about SLE in pregnancy. Is SLE in pregnancy a very uncommon condition? No. When you will become a clinician, you will see that SLE in pregnancy, you are going to see these patients in your clinics. Why? Because 90% cases of SLE are seen in women and prevalence of SLE in childbearing women is 1 in 500 women. In every 1 in 500 females, you are going to see SLE. SLE, right? And in 50% patients of SLE involvement, uh, SLE, there is going to be renal involvement. So, this is a common condition which you are going to see routinely treated. I'm not going to say routinely treat, but it is not uncommon that you are going to get a patient of SLE in pregnancy, right? Now, whenever you have a patient of SLE in pregnancy, what is the best screening test for SLE? The best screening test for SLE is anti-nuclear antibodies. So, I am going to get her tested for anti-nuclear antibodies. Once I know my patient has SLE, then there are other tests also which I'm going to order. All of you know that uh, SLE in pregnancy can lead to APLA syndrome and for APLA syndrome, I'm going to check antiphospholipid antibodies. What are the antibodies you are going to check for? You're going to check for lupus anticoagulant. You are going to check for anti-cardiolipin antibody and you are going to check for beta 2 microglobulin that is glycoprotein 1 antibody. Right. Then uh, another thing which you have to check is because whenever there is SLE and if your patient has anti-SSA and anti-SSB antibodies, there are high chances of congenital heart block in the fetus. Right. So I am going to check for SSA and SSB antibodies. Other than that, I'm also going to check for double stranded DNA and the levels of C3, C4, C3, C4 titer. Why am I doing that? Because if the double stranded DNA is increased or if C3, C4 titers are decreased, that indicates an, a flare of SLE during pregnancy. So I am going to get all this tested during pregnancy when a patient of SLE comes to me. Now, uh, if there is a female who is a diagnosed case of SLE and if she has conceived, what are the conditions in which you are going to get, uh, you are expecting a good prognosis and what are those things where you expect a bad prognosis? So, if lupus activity has been quiescent for six months before conception, I expect a good prognosis and that is why to patients who have SLE, we recommend them that they should conceive only after the disease has become quiescent for six months or more. Number two, if lupus nephritis is absent. Number three, if anti-lupus and anti-phospholipid antibodies are absent. And number four, if superimposed preeclampsia doesn't develop. In all these conditions, prognosis is going to be good. Prognosis is also going to be good if your patient has only cutaneous lupus and there is no renal involvement. A newly diagnosed SLE during pregnancy definitely has adverse outcome. Right? Now, let's talk specifically about lupus nephritis. Now, active nephritis during pregnancy is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. Why it is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes? Because it can lead to gestational hypertension. It can lead to preeclampsia during pregnancy. It can lead to renal insufficiency. It can lead to flaring up of the disease during pregnancy. Now, one of the very important reasons for preterm labor is whenever there is maternal stress or when 
whenever there is fetal stress obviously if mother has gestational hypertension or preeclampsia she is going to be in stress and all this can precipitate preterm labor so these are all the problems which can happen if there is lupus uh, nephritis during pregnancy now if a pregnant female with lupus nephritis is going to conceive because i know that there are increased chances of flare up because i know there are increased chances of pih and gestational hypertension number one i am going to continue her immunosuppression and the drugs which you can use during pregnancy are hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine please remember it is one of those anti malarials which can be given even during the first trimester other than hydroxychloroquine you can give cyclosporin as a thioprin and tacrolimus now uh, if it is a new onset nephritis during pregnancy then i need a stronger drug and then instead of using hydroxychloroquine it's better that you use tacrolimus and iv corticosteroids or iv immunoglobulins as i told you that if there is a uh, lupus nephritis during pregnancy that can lead to preeclampsia that can lead to gestational hypertension so in order to prevent preeclampsia from happening i'm going to give them low dose aspirin throughout pregnancy now if the disease is severe i am also going to advise them to take corticosteroids which can be given in high doses as well for arthralgias you are going to give them nsaids but remember that you should not give uh, you know nsaids for a very long time and you should not give very heavy doses of nsaids why because if you are giving heavy doses of nsaids or if you are using nsaids for a very long time during pregnancy they have a tendency to lead to oligohydramnios and premature closure of ductus arteriosus especially if you ha- have been using which drug endomethacin very right then for de- on- if there is only dermatitis or if there is arthralgia you can use hydroxychloroquine now the drugs uh, which have to be avoided during pregnancy in a patient of sle they are methotrexate mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide as far as cyclophosphamide is concerned if you are dealing with a very severe disease then cyclophosphamide can be used in second and third trimester but not in first trimester but definitely methotrexate and mycophenolate they are absolutely contraindicated during pregnancy clear to all of you Okay. Next question: Which of the following is false regarding management of diabetes in pregnancy? Diabetes is another very very important topic. Whether it is NEET, whether it is INI set or FMG exams, definitely you get questions on PIH. You get questions on diabetes. So these are the two topics which you have to remember for any exam which you are appearing for. Now uh, the options which were given to you were: elective C-section has no role in reducing incidence of brachial plexus injury in a patient being planned for induction of labor night dose of intermediate insulin is given as planned and morning dose is withheld in active labor if rbs is less than 70 mg dextrose 5% is started at 100 to 150 ml per hour till rbs is more than 100 capillary blood glucose monitoring levels are kept at fasting 95 1 rpp 142 rpp 120 now this was one of the questions which was directly from one of the tables which is given in a uh, williams right for manage of diabetes during labor i am quickly going to help you in memorizing some of the important points related to management of diabetes as a whole so uh, whenever you are dealing with a diabetic patient during pregnancy the metabolic goals whether your patient is on diet modification alone or whether your patient is on insulin the metabolic goals or the target with which we are aim at are fasting blood sugar less than 95 one hr pp less than 140 2 RPP less than 120, average capillary glucose less than 100, and HB A1C less than 6. That is what our aim is. You know, if patient is able to achieve 6.5, that is good. But uh, that is also acceptable. I will not say that's good. That is acceptable. But our aim is that our HB A1C should come to less than 6. Now, whenever I have a case of pre-gestational diabetes, for a case of pre-gestational diabetes, what all management are you going to do? Number one, you are going to give them weight counselling. Number two, diet modification, that is medical nutrition therapy. Number three, you are going to put them on insulin. A patient of pre-gestational diabetes ideally should be put on insulin before she conceives. But if she did not come to you in the pre-conception period, then as soon as she comes to you, you have to switch her from oral hypoglycemic drugs to insulin. 
insulin. Remember, oral hypoglycemic drugs are contraindicated during pregnancy. There are only two oral hypoglycemic drugs which can be given during pregnancy. One of them is metformin and other is gliburide. But that too only in cases of gestational diabetes, never for a case of pre-gestational diabetes and only if your patient refuses to use insulin. So whenever they ask you this question that what is the drug of choice for treating diabetes in pregnancy, whether it is gestational diabetes, whether it is pre-gestational diabetes, the standard answer is insulin. Now, in case of pre-gestational diabetes, see, diabetes is one of the very important risk factors for PIH. So, whenever I have a case of pre-gestational diabetes, I know my patient can develop PIH. So, in order to prevent PIH from happening, I'm going to give them low-dose aspirin. Right. So this is something which you have to remember that in all those conditions where there is an, a very high chance of your patient having PIH, in all those cases, ACOG recently has started recommending that you have to give a low dose aspirin. This low dose aspirin, you have to start from 12 weeks. Right. Ideally, you should start from 12 weeks and not later than 16 weeks. Right. Then... Uh, in case of gestational diabetes, how am I going to manage? In case of gestational diabetes, I am going to, you know, one and two will be the same. That I am going to give them weight counselling. I am going to put them on medical nutrition therapy. That is diet modification. Now, in gestational diabetes, you have to put your patient uh, only on medical nutrition therapy for two weeks. For two weeks, you just put your patient on diet modification and then after two weeks, you check her for the metabolic goals. If metabolic goals are attained, you continue with the medical nutrition therapy only. And if metabolic goals are not attained, you put your patient on insulin and along with that, you continue with the medical nutrition therapy. Now, if your patient is of gestational diabetes, whether she is continuing with only MNT or whether she is continuing with insulin and MNT and that stands true for your uh, pre-gestational diabetic patients also. That once you've decided or titrated the dose of insulin for them, it is not this that you're going to forget about it. Right? You should remember that as pregnancy advances, the insulin resistance keeps on increasing. And because insulin resistance keeps on increasing, the dose of insulin has to be increased. That is why in all diabetic patients, our Government of India guidelines, our national guidelines are that after every two weeks you have to check their two RPP levels and their fasting blood sugar levels in every second trimester and every week in third trimester right because as I told you insulin resistance keeps on increasing so the dose of insulin has to be titrated accordingly right now this is the way you are going to carry these pregnancies up till 39 weeks now, on the day of labor, what are you going to do when you are going when you are going for induction of labor? What are you going to do one night before? Now, this is what is ACOG guidelines, right? I am also going to tell you our national guidelines, but this particular question which was asked to you was typically asked on the ACOG guidelines and this over here is a screenshot of Williams for you. So, one, uh, you know, the night before you are planning induction, you are going to give her the evening dose of insulin. But the morning dose of insulin should be withheld. And then on the day of induction, you are going to start normal saline. This normal saline, you are going to start at 100 to 125 ml per hour. And then you are going to check their blood sugar levels after every hour. Simultaneously, if the blood sugar levels are more than 100, according to ACOG, if blood sugar levels are more than 100, you are going to start insulin and you are going to give this insulin 1 to 1.25 units per hour and keep on checking her blood sugar levels after every hour and titrate the dose accordingly. Now, if, if your pay, whenever your patient goes into active labor or if the blood sugar levels of your patient are more than 70 but less than 100, in that case, you will have to shift your patient from a normal saline. You will ha have to stop normal saline and you will have to start 5% dextrose so that minimum blood sugar levels are maintained at 100. 
clear to all of you this is what acog says stop the morning dose give the previous night evening dose then give your patient insulin and give your patient normal saline you are going to give pay your patient insulin only if blood sugar levels are more than 100 right then uh, you are going to how much uh, insulin are you going to give 1 to 1.25 international units you are going to give your patient normal saline as well start normal saline at the rate of 100 to 125 ml per hour and if your blood sugar levels of your patient are between 70 to 100 then in that case rather than giving her normal saline switch her to 5% dextrose clear to all of you now the other thing which you have to remember is what our national guidelines say our national guidelines are this this is a screenshot from our national guidelines see i want all of you to remember that if you are giving ini set you have to remember both the guidelines you have to remember guidelines which are given by acog and that is the international guidelines and you have to remember the guide our national guidelines but if you are a neat pg aspirant then you have to remember only our national guidelines clear now what do our national guidelines say the basics are say that the evening dose of insulin has to be given the morning dose of insulin has to be withheld then you have to start normal saline again in at the same rate the only thing is that our national guidelines say number 1 you have to monitor blood glucose after every 2 hours number 1 number 2 our national guidelines say that you are going to give insulin once the levels of blood sugar become more than 120 so if the levels of blood sugar are between 120 to 140 you are going to give four international units 140 to 180 you are going to give six international units and if they are more than 180 you are going to give eight international units right clear to all of you this is what our national guidelines say now if i ask you at what time do you terminate pregnancy you are going to terminate pregnancy in a case of gestational diabetes that is type a1 diabetes what do you understand by type a1 type a1 means a gestational diabetes which is controlled only on diet the time of termination of pregnancy is 39 weeks a2 gestational diabetes what do you understand by a2 gestational diabetes that means a diabetes which is controlled on insulin or on uh, your oral hypoglycemic drugs that is metformin or gliburide now if your patient is a case of a2 gestational diabetes and her blood sugar levels are well controlled again you are going to terminate her pregnancy at 39 weeks but it is a2 gestational diabetes and her blood sugar levels are not well controlled in that case you are going to terminate pregnancy between 37 weeks to 38 weeks plus 6 days pre gestational diabetes again at 39 weeks clear to all of you so these are all very very important questions which you have to remember with respect to diabetes in pregnancy coming to the next question which of the following statements regarding magnesium sulfate is false magnesium sulfate and pih this time they were the hot favorite que- topics for your ini set exam as well as for your neat pg in neat pg there were four questions in neat pg 2022 on pih and that is why many details related to the pathophysiology of pih and magnesium sulfate i have told you in the neat pg recall which is going to follow after i i said so for a better understanding of the pathophysiology of pih and for all important points related to magnesium sulfate please watch the video of neat pg recall which is going to follow after the ini set recall over here i am just discussing uh, the important points right so magnesium sulfate all of you know that's the drug of choice for preventing and treating seizures in a pregnant female in whom the bp is high right but please remember that magnesium sulfate is an anti convulsant drug which is going to act only when the patient's bp is high it is not an anti hypertensive drug that's a very important thing which you have to remember magnesium sulfate is never going to bring down the blood pressure of the patient another important thing which you have to remember so one thing which you have to remember is it is not not an anti convulsant right the other very important point which you have to remember about magnesium sulfate is that it is centrally acting drug how does magnesium sulfate act it acts by blocking the nmda receptors in the brain number 1 number 2 it brings about cerebral vasodilatation number 3 it decreases acetylcholine release and number 4 it is also a calcium channel blocker and this is the reason why magnesium sulfate has to be used very very carefully with other calcium channel blockers right then 
Magnesium sulfate is a drug which has got a very narrow therapeutic range. When I say a narrow therapeutic range, it is 4 to 7 milli equivalents per liter. What do you understand by narrow therapeutic range? Which this means that if magnesium sulfate is less than 4, patient will continue to throw convulsions. If it becomes, if its levels becomes more than 7 in blood, then the patient starts showing manifestations of toxicity. Now, when you have to give magnesium sulfate, we give it according to Prichard regime. All details of Prichard regime are are in the neat recall video which is going to follow. Now, in Prichard regime, you have to give an, a loading dose and then you have to give maintenance dose. When you are giving loading dose, you should not worry about the renal function of the patient, right? Irrespective of a renal function, you have to give the loading dose of magnesium sulfate, which is 4 grams IV 20% solution and 10 grams IM 50% solution. But when you are giving the maintenance dose for magnesium sulfate, then for giving the maintenance dose, you definitely have to check her urine output, you have to check her knee jerk and you have to check her respiratory rate. Then only you give the maintenance dose. Right. So let us see what options over here they are. Magnesium sulfate causes uterine relaxation. Yes. Magnesium sulfate also leads to uterine relaxation. So it could have been used as a tocolytic agent as well. But it is not used as a tocolytic agent because it causes uterine relaxation in a dose-dependent manner and at concentration of 9 to 10 milli equivalents per liter. And the moment concentration becomes 9 to 10 milli equivalent per liter, your patient starts showing symptoms of toxicity. For example, what are the symptoms of toxicity of magnesium sulfate? So, magnesium sulfate toxicity symptoms are number one, loss of knee jerk. Loss of knee jerk is going to happen when magnesium concentration is 10 milli equivalents per liter. And if you have to give a range, then the range which you have to mark is 10 to 12 milli equivalents per liter. Other than this, there is going to be diaphoresis, there is going to be sweating. Right? So there is going to be diaphoresis, sweating, slurring of speech. Then there is going to be decreased respiratory rate. In other words, there is going to be respiratory paralysis later on followed by respiratory arrest. And number four, there is going to be cardiac arrest or cardiac conduction defects. Right, so these are all symptoms which you can get in magnesium sulfate toxicity. Remember, decreased urine output is not a symptom of magnesium sulfate toxicity. Then why am I looking at urine output? This is because magnesium is excreted via kidneys. Right, so that is why we look at the urine output. So magnesium sulfate is to be continued for 24 hours after delivery or last attack of seizure. Yes, the maintenance dose of magnesium sulfate which you have to give after every 4 hours and that is 5 grams magnesium sulfate after every 4 hours IM intramuscularly as a 50% solution. This has to be continued for 24 hours after delivery or for 24 hours after the last seizure whichever is happening later. So this is the correct statement. It has inhibitory effect on cerebral cortex. This is right. Thereby preventing seizures and lowering BP. No. That's incorrect. Magnesium sulfate has no effect on BP. It is not an antihypertensive drug. Right? In renal failure, magnesium sulfate loading dose can be given, but maintenance dose should be adjusted based on renal function. That's right. Whenever you are giving loading dose, irrespective of renal function, you have to give the loading dose. For maintenance dose, you are going to check the renal function and you are going to adjust the maintenance dose accordingly. Clear to all of you? Then, all of the following are theories of causation of preeclampsia except again pathophysiology of PIH I am going to tell you in the neat recall video. Just remember that in case of PIH what is happening? In case of PIH there is placental ischemia. Why is there placental ischemia? This is because pressure and volume are inversely related. So when pressure and volume are inversely related the volume of blood coming to the placenta is decreased and that leads to placental ischemia. How does 
does this happen? I am going to tell you in the need recall video. Now, when there is going to be placental ischemia, placenta releases, releases inflammatory mediators in the mother's circulation and these inflammatory mediators, they include cytokines and TNF-alpha. It also releases vasoconstrictors in the mother's circulation and these vasoconstrictors are thromboxane A2, SFLT1, that is soluble FMS like tyroxine kinase 1 and serum endoclin. And it decreases vasodilators. The vasodilators which are going to decrease are prostacyclins, nitric oxide, vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. Now, because of all this, what is going to happen? Because of all this, number one, there is going to be increased BP in the mother. And that is why one of the most important or the earliest sign of preeclampsia or PIH is increase in BP. The other thing which is going to happen is all these inflammatory mediators and vas vasoconstrictors, they are going to lead to leaky capillaries. They are going to lead to capillary endothelial damage. They are going to damage the endothelium of the capillaries. Now, because the endothelium of the capillaries is going to get damaged, that is why there is going, you know, the fluid component of the blood is going to come out and the cellular component will remain inside the capillaries leading to hemoconcentration and because the fluid component is coming out, there is third space accumulation of that fluid component leading to ascites leading to edema right and this hemoconcentration platelet aggregation is going to happen platelet stasis is going to happen all this is what is Virchow's triad so hemoconcentration platelet aggregation platelet stasis all this is what is going to activate or that is what is your Virchow's triad and that leads to thrombosis right, thrombosis in blood vessels. So, depending upon which blood vessel is getting thrombosed, thrombosis is happening in which vessel, that particular organ failure you get. That is why in case of preeclampsia or in case of PIH, there is multiple organ defect or there is end organ damage, right? So, keeping this in mind, let's see what are the options given to us. Prostaglandins play an important role. Thromboxin A2 decreases. Does thromboxin A2 decrease? No. Thromboxin A2 increases. Prostacyclin is to thromboxin ratio increases? No. Rather, it is prostacyclin which decreases and thromboxin which increases. So, this ratio decreases during pregnancy. So, option A is incorrect. Option B, endothelial cell dysfunction leads to reduce nitric oxide levels and this causes clinical presentation of preeclampsia. Yes. Vasoconstriction leads to ischemia, necrosis, hemorrhage and n organ damage. Damage, yes, and T angiogenic factors play an important role in play eclampsia. There is increase in SFLT1 and decrease in platelet growth factor. Yes. So over here, option B, C, and D are correct. Option A is the incorrect option. Now I want all of you, all of you to make a chart of all the mediators which are decreased in case of PIH and all the mediators which are increased in case of PIH. That's very, very important. Note all these important points. Make a chart of it in your 20th notebook so that before you appear for your exams, you quickly go through this chart. Right. Coming to the next question, the following cost effective investigations are routinely recommended in screening of antenatal mothers except and that's a very easy one. We all know urine analysis is done in an antenatal patient. Blood sugar levels for GDM is done. VDRL for syphilis is done. But echocardiography for cardiac disease is done only if it is indicated. So quickly let us see what are the tests which are done in the first antenatal visit. Whenever a patient comes to you for the first antenatal visit, you are going to check her ABO and RH. And if your patient is RH, negative, you should do the RH typing of the husband because if husband is RH positive, then there are 50% chances that this RH negative mother is going to carry an RH positive fetus and that becomes a high risk pregnancy, right? Number two, you have to measure her hemoglobin. Our government of India guidelines say that hemoglobin should be measured at least four times in pregnancy. I hope all of you remember that our national guidelines say that there have to be at least four antenatal visits. So, government of India says that whenever a patient is coming for 
to you for those four antenatal visits you have to check her hemoglobin in those four visits and if her hemoglobin comes out to be less than 11 gram percent that means your patient has anemia then it should be followed by peripheral blood smear complete blood count and hemoglobin electrophoresis then you are going to check her for syphilis which you can do either by vdrl or rpr then hiv testing it is a universal screening has to be done but then a patient can say no that is there is opt out approach hiv testing has to be done by elisa then hbsag and rubella susceptibility screening screening for diabetes as per the dipsy criteria what is our dipsy criteria dipsy criteria says that you have to do screening for diabetes in the first antenatal visit and then between 24 to 28 weeks how do you do the screening irrespective of the previous meals you are going to give your patient 75 grams of glucose and then you are going to check uh, which has to be mixed in water in 200 to 300 ml of water and it has to be taken uh, within you know uh, 10 minutes this water should be consumed glucose mixed water and then you have to check her blood sugar levels after 2 hours right that is what our dipsy guidelines our national guidelines say then you have to do urine routine microscopy for proteins for sugar for pus cells and for evidence of bacteria by dipstick method this is because asymptomatic bacteria is common during pregnancy and asymptomatic bacteria can lead to preterm labor it can lead to uh, you know pyelonephritis that is why you have to be very vigilant for asymptomatic bacteria and by dipstick method you have to check for asymptomatic bacteria then gbs screening it is done between 35 to 37 weeks by recto vaginal swab for culture and sensitivity right the optional tests which government of india says can be done are aneuploidy screening and tsh and government of india says that there is no need to do a torch test even in case of recurrent abortions there is no need to do a torch test right these are all the things which are recommended by government of india for antenatal patients they also remember what are the ultrasounds which are done during pregnancy number one there is a dating scan or a viability scan which should be done between 6 to 8 weeks then a nuchal translucency scan to check for the nuchal translucency it is done between 11 to 13 weeks plus 6 days a normally scan which is also called as a booking scan or a target scan or tifa it is done in 18 to 20 weeks and this is one ultrasound which has to be done in all pregnant females right between 18 so during an entire pregnancy if a female can afford only one ultrasound then that ultrasound should be an anomaly scan which is done between 18 to 20 weeks and a growth scan between 30 to 32 weeks right so over here you know your answer echocardiography is not recommended in all pregnant females just in case your patient you are expecting that there is going to be a fetal heart defect uh, you know then that you are going to go for a fetal e to echocardiography and echocardiography for the fetus you are going to do between 22 to 24 weeks right so can you tell me in which conditions in ops do you recommend a patient to get a fetal echocardiography done number 1 in case of pregestational diabetes right all of you remember pregestational diabetes can lead to congenital anomaly and the most common congenital anomalies involve which system they involve cardiovascular system so in a case of pregestational uh, diabetic i am going to advise them to undergo a fetal echocardiography echocardiography similarly in case of twin to twin transfusion syndrome for twin to twin transfusion syndrome also it is very important for you to advise fetal echocardiography right now all of the following coagulation factors increase in pregnancy except and this is a very very commonly asked question and i know you know this answer it is factor 11 so all factors increase except factor 11 and factor 13 over here in this table i have mentioned all the important things which are related to hematological system which you should be knowing right hematological changes which occur during pregnancy in all my lectures whether it is online or whether it is offline i make you write all these things just in case you are missing out on any point just pause this video and note the important points which i have written over here i am not reading them out for you that will be an absolute waste of time just one thing remember that the factors which remain constant during pregnancy is the factor which remain constant in pregnancy or unchanged in pregnancy are bleeding time clotting time cd4 is to cd8 ratio and b lymphocytes these are the ones which remain unchanged during pregnancy all the other things which you need to know with respect to changes which occur in the hematological system during pregnancy i have jotted them down for you here clear 
Okay, coming to the next question, all of the following are diagnostic criteria for preterm labor except. Now, in case of preterm labor, uh, there is a new definition which has been given by ACOG and I want all of you to remember the conventional definition and the new definition both. So, according to ACOG 2020, preterm labor is regular uterine contractions which are accompanied by progressive dilatation and effacement of the cervix. So, that's a very simple definition that if a female is having regular uterine contractions and along with that there is progressive dilatation and progressive effacement of the cervix, that is what is preterm labor. Another alternative definition which is given by ACOG in 2020 is if there are regular uterine contractions and the dilatation of the cervix is more than equal to 2 centimeters at the time of initial presentation. So these are the two new definitions which are given by ACOG for defining preterm labor. The conventional definition which I have always taught you and which was there till now was any fee pregnant female having uterine contractions, how many contractions more than four contractions in 20 minutes or may more than eight contractions in 60 minutes with any one of the three and what are those number one dilatation of the cervix more than equal to three centimeters length of the cervix less than equal to two centimeters and fetal fibronectin protein present please remember length of the cervix to predict preterm labor to predict preterm labor that is less than 2.5 centimeters less than equal to 2.5 centimeters but length of the cervix to diagnose preterm labor is less than equal to 2 centimeters whenever your patient is coming to you with uterine contractions and the length of the cervix is decreased to less than 2 centimeters you say that your patient is in preterm labor or if the dilatation is more than equal to 3 centimeters that is what it initially said now this dilatation they have changed to more than equal to 2 centimeters and it earlier said that if there is fetal fibronectin protein present where is the fetal fibronectin protein present you are going to check for fetal fibronectin protein in the cervical vaginal secretion so whenever a patient comes to you with preterm labor there are two swabs which you should take number one you should take a rectovaginal swab for group B streptococci uh, you know screening GBS screening and number two a cervical vaginal swab this cervical vaginal swab you are taking to check the levels of fetal fibronectin protein if fetal fibronectin protein is more than equal to 50 nanograms per ml then that is considered an, as positive and a positive or a presence of fetal fibronectin protein in cervical vaginal swab it indicates either the onset of preterm labor or preterm premature rupture of membranes right so if it is happening before 37 weeks that indicates preterm premature rupture of membranes or preterm labor clear to all of you now look over here now they are saying all of the following are diagnostic criteria for preterm labor except option a four contractions in 20 minutes yes or eight contractions in 60 minutes with changes in cervix cervical dilatation more than equal to 2 centimeters. Now, if they say more than equal to 2 centimeters, that is correct. But what students told me, some of them, they said that ma'am, in the option, it was written as more than equal to 1 centimeter. Now, if it was written more than equal to 2 centimeters, then I'm absolute, you have just now seen that the definition has been revised and it is more than equal to 2 centimeters. Now, suppose it was more than equal to 1 centimeter and not more than equal to 2 centimeters, then also your answer will be unchanged. Why? I'll just tell you. More than 80% effaced cervix, yes. Cervix posterior in position. Now, if cervix is posterior in position, that doesn't indicate preterm labor. Rather, for labor process to begin, the cervix should become anterior and it should not remain posterior. Now, if suppose dilatation given was more than equal to 1 centimeter, in that case also, I would have ruled out option D and I would have included more than equal to 1 centimeter in the correct options because the new definitions say that there has to be progressive dilatation of the cervix. So, if cervix is more than 1 centimeter, I would admit my patient and I would look for whether the dilatation is increasing or not right so then also their answer would have been unchanged clear to all of you so the answer over here is option d 
then there was another question which was based you can say either on preterm labor or you can say based on cervical incompetence and that was a question on cervical cerclage a very important topic again for all of you is when should cervical cerclage be applied and in which conditions it should not be applied in which conditions the next step becomes the that you have to measure the length of the cervix all this again i have taught you in the neat pg recall because there were two questions based on cervical cerclage there so th uh, over here i am again concentrating on the basics of the cerclage operation because that is what they have asked you which of the following cerclage procedures would be done in a non pregnant woman now understand when do you do a cervical cerclage see there are two places in obs where you've studied cervical cerclage number one you have studied cervical cerclage in case of cervical incompetence right and number two you have studied it to prevent preterm labor now cervical cerclage you can do it in case of uh, you know second cervical incompetence you can do it before the cervix gets dilated or you may also do it once the cervix has already started dilating when you do it when the cervix has already started dilating that is what is called as a rescue cerclage and when you do it when the cervix has not yet dilated in a case of cervical incompetence that is called as prophylactic cerclage prophylactic cerclage you do it as i told you you do it in case of cervical incompetence and when do you do number 1 if your patient is giving you history of two second trimester abortions then straight away without measuring the cervical length you are going to do cerclage at what time are you going to do cerclage cerclage surgeries are done between 14 to 24 weeks earliest you can do it between 12 to 14 weeks right or suppose if your patient is giving you history of only one second trimester abortion in that case it is very important that you measure her cervical length and if cervical length is coming less than equal to 2.5 cm on ultrasound then you go for cervical cerclage similarly in in case of preterm labor if you are getting history of one preterm labor in that case again you are going to measure the cervical length and if cervical length is less than 2.5 cm and it is a singleton pregnancy then you are going to put a cerclage clear to all of you so one was history based cerclage in history based cerclage if you are getting two history of two second trimester abortions then straight away without measuring the cervical length go for cerclage right the other one is if you are getting history of one second trimester abortion or your question says there is history of one preterm labor which happened at less than equal to 28 weeks in that case again i'm going to measure her cervical length and if cervical length is a uh, less than 2.5 cm then i am going to go for cervical cerclage right now in case of the cervix has already dilated so if it is a case of patient is giving you history of uh, second trimester abortion and this time she has come and her cervix has already started dilating and if you are putting a cervical cerclage at that time that is what is called as emergency cerclage or it is also called as rescue cerclage normally i told you cerclage surgery is done up till 24 weeks but rcog says that a rescue cerclage it can be done up till 27 weeks right now coming to what are the cerclage procedures which can be performed see cerclage procedures you can do it as i told you just now in a pregnant female or you may do it in a non pregnant female if a patient is giving you history of two previous second trimester abortions you can do it in a non pregnant female also now when you do it in a non pregnant female you have to do it trans abdominally by laparoscopy now when you are doing it in a pregnant female you can either go for trans vaginal approach or you can go for trans abdominal approach common sense tells me trans vaginal approach is more easy right number 1 it's simpler and number 2 if you are doing a trans vaginal approach the cerclage stitch the stitch which you have applied you can just cut it and you can proceed with vaginal delivery 
but if you are going if you have done a trans abdominal cerclage via laparoscopy or by laparotomy in that case you are going to you know go for a cesarean section so always we prefer doing trans vaginal cerclage unless and until you are doing it in a non pregnant female or if there are conditions where the cervix is not approachable right for examples it's a congenitally short cervix amputated cervix marked scarring of cervix or if there is a previously failed vaginal cerclage then in these conditions you do a trans abdominal cerclage in a pregnant female now coming to the methods the most commonly done trans vaginal cerclage surgery is what is the your mcdonnell cerclage in which you are going to apply purse string sutures as close to the internal os as possible then but the best results you get it with chirurgical cerclage the first done vaginal cerclage was lash and lash and then we have a worms cerclage now the difference between mcdonnell cerclage and worms cerclage is mcdonnell cerclage is done by using a non absorbable uh, polyfilament suture or you can also use a mercelin tape but in case of uh, worm cerclage you are going to use a monofilament proline suture and you are going to put two circumferential sutures in case of mcdonalds you are giving a purse string suture like this in case of a worm cerclage you are going to give two circumferential sutures on the cervix that is what is a worms stitch or worms cerclage now when we are talking about trans abdominal cerclage trans abdominal cerclage you can do by laparoscopy or by laparotomy and the method is benson and durfee cerclage right so this is what you have to know about the cerclage surgeries when do you remove the stitch or the cerclage in case of transvaginal cerclage you are going to do it at 37 weeks in which condition is cerclage surgery contraindicated it is contraindicated if the membranes are ruptured if there is any active genital infection or if fetus has got gross congenital anomalies a relative contraindication for cerclage surgery is placenta previa clear to all of you so over here they have asked you the question and that question is which of the following cerclage procedures would be done in a non pregnant female lash and lash no that was the first one which is not done these days benson and durfee that is a trans abdominal method which is done in pregnant females worm cerclage just now i told you it is with the help of a monofilament proline suture and you are going to apply two sutures on the cervix laparoscopic cerclage yes right then coming to the next question urinary tract infection now uti and acute pyelonephritis these were two again very important topics which were asked in ini set and before you appear for your next ini set or you appear for your neat you should revise asymptomatic bacteria uti in pregnancy and acute pyelonephritis during pregnancy now uti infection in a pregnant lady in a second trimester is best defined as growth of 10 to the power of 3 coliform in a suprapubic sample growth of 10 to the power of 5 coliforms in a voided urine sample frequency with dysuria with more than 3 wbcs per high power field frequency with dysuria with positive nitrite and leucoesterase dipstick test so all of you know that uti is defined in the second trimester if there is growth of more than equal to 10 to the power of 5 coliforms in a voided urine sample so when we are talking about uti the best method to evaluate uti in a pregnant female is urine culture uti can be asymptomatic and when you are getting asymptomatic uti that is there are more than equal to 10 to the power of 5 coliforms in a voided sample then that is what is asymptomatic bacteria without any symptoms and if uh, asymptomatic bacteria is not treated it can result in preterm labor it may later give rise to symptoms that is there can be cystitis or there can be pyelonephritis most common organism which leads to asymptomatic bacteria is e coli and that is why i told you in all pregnant females whenever they are coming to you in each trimester you are going to do a urine routine microscopy and you are going to check 
Uh, you are going to do a dipstick method to check for asymptomatic bacteria for nitrite and leukocyte esterase, right? Now, a uh, symptomatic UTI, the most common symptomatic UTI is cystitis in which a patient is going to come to you with complaint of dysuria, urgency and frequency. Plus, there is going to be bacteria, pyuria and microscopic hematuria. As far as pyelonephritis is concerned, patient is going to come to you with complaint of fever and with chills and she is going to come to you with complaint of lumbar pain right about pyelonephritis i will just now tell you now asymptomatic bacteria is something which you should uh, suspect and you should always be on the lookout for asymptomatic bacteria is very common in patients who have diabetes and sickle cell anemia how do you manage asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy or how do you manage cystitis during pregnancy you are going to give them antibiotics amoxicillin ampicillin cephalosporin or trimethyl methoprim sulfamethoxazole for management of asymptomatic bacteria you can give a single dose or you can give three days therapy in case of cystitis you always have to give these antibiotics for three days now if they ask you what is the drug of choice for a resistant case of a uti or for a recurrent case of uti then always the best answer is nitrofurantoin right so uh, over here, yes, it is growth of 10 to the power of 5 coliforms in a voided urine sample, right? Now, I am not telling you many details about is uh, pyelonephritis over, over there in that question because we had a question on management of pyelonephritis in pregnancy. A pregnant lady at 20 weeks of gestation comes with complaints of acute onset of fever, pain in the right lumbar region, which is associated with chills, nausea, vomiting. Urine analysis reveals E. coli and diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis is made. Which of the following is incorrect regarding the management of acute pyelonephritis in pregnancy? Again, this is one of the, those questions which is picked up directly from a table of Williams. Right? So, let us quickly talk about pyelonephritis in pregnancy. Pyelonephritis is the most common serious non-obstetrical medical complication of pregnancy and it is one of the leading causes of septic shock during pregnancy. That is why we say it is a very, very, you know, emergency condition. You have to treat it rigorously and it leads to increased chances of cerebral palsy in the newborns. Risk factors for acute pyelonephritis are nulliparity and young age. Risk factors for asymptomatic bacteria were diabetes and sickle cell anemia. Right. Please remember that pyelonephritis is more common in second half of pregnancy. It is uh, unilateral pyelonephritis is more common and in unilateral it is the right side which is more commonly involved. And the most common or causative organism for asymptomatic bacteria and for acute pyelonephritis or UTI in pregnancy is E. coli. The presenting symptoms of the patient are patient is going to come to you with complaint of fever and chills. There will be pain in lumbar region, anorexia, nausea and vomiting. Whenever you are treating a patient of acute pyelonephritis, you are going to monitor her serum creatinine levels because acute pyelonephritis can lead to renal failure, number one. Number two, the endotoxins which are produced in this case, they can lead to a pulmonary injury, that is they can lead to ARDS. That is why if your patient of pyelonephritis is having dyspnea, then you should always get a chest x-ray done. Then it can lead to preterm labor. Now because uh, you know, uh, acute pyelonephritis can lead to preterm labor and suppose you are thinking about giving her corticosteroids and for the corticosteroids to act you think that I am going to give her tocolytics and if you give her tocolytic beta agonist then already in this patient there is there is pulmonary injury there is pulmonary edema there is ARDS and on top of that if you give her beta agonist that can again precipitate pulmonary edema that is why beta agonist as tocolytics are contraindicated in patients who have acute pyelonephritis then endotoxins can also lead to hemolysis right this is the reason why you are going to do a CBC whenever you are admitting a patient of pyelonephritis. So, how do you manage a patient of pyelonephritis? You are going to hospitalize the patient, you are going to monitor her vital signs and her urine output. In order to maintain her urine output, you are going to give her IV fluids and you have to maintain her urine output to more than equal to 50 ml per hour. That's very, very important. 
the investigations which you are going to send just now i told you it can lead to septic shock so you are going to give blood cultures urine cultures serum creatinine levels serum electrolyte levels complete hemogram it can lead to anemia and if dyspnea is present you are going to get a chest x-ray done all these investigations you are going to do at the time of admission and then you are going to repeat them after 48 hours Now the main stay of management of acute pyelonephritis number 1 is maintaining urine output by giving her IV fluids and number 2 is giving her antibiotics you are going to start IV antibiotics to your patient and you are going to give ampicillin and gentamicin you may also give her ceftriaxone and once the patient becomes a febrile then you are going to switch to oral antibiotics initially you are going to start with IV antibiotics you are going to discharge your patient 24 hours after your patient patient becomes a febrile but you are going to continue her antibiotics for any renal infection i am sure you've done in your medicine and in your surgery that antibiotics should at least be continued for 7 to 10 days so you are going to continue the oral antibiotics in a pregnant female also for 7 to 10 days and once the antibiotic course is complete after one or two weeks repeat her urine culture so this is the entire management of acute pyelonephritis in pregnancy and i want all of you to note down each and every point which i have told you right so over here uh, the options are which of the following is incorrect so understand they are asking about incorrect regarding management of acute pyelonephritis in pregnancy hospitalize send urine and blood culture and start antibiotic common sense tells me i have to do that oral antibiotics once the patient is a febrile yes maintain urine output to more than 50 ml per hour iv crystalloids can be given yes discharge if the patient is a febrile for 72 hours no you have to discharge once the patient is a febrile for 24 hours and continue antibiotics for 5 days no you have to continue antibiotics for 7 to 10 days right so the answer over here is option d clear now kazovitz rule is related to this is something which i keep on telling you in your lectures as well that kazovitz rule is related to congenital syphilis and what does kazovitz rule say kazovitz rule say that as the number of time a female of congenital syphilis becomes pregnant right the trans placental transmission to the fetus decreases in other words the prognosis of the fetus improves as the number of pregnancies increase which means that i am writing this kazovitz rule here for you kazovitz rule says that as the number of pregnancies increase in syphilis the prognosis is going to become better the prognosis becomes better now this can be written as that the period of gestation at which the loss is going to happen at which the loss occurs increases right so if your patient of congenital syphilis has abortion first trimester abortion for the first time then usually you be see that next time she might have second trimester abortion or she may straight away have a stillbirth and then there will be a live birth with the baby having syphilis right so this is how it goes so if i ask you does syphilis lead to recurrent abortions no recurrent abortion means three or more than three abortions and according to kazovitz law whenever there is congenital syphilis whenever mother has got syphilis then as the number of pregnancies is going to increase the trans placental transmission will decrease the prognosis of the baby is going to become better right so at the most your mother can have first trimester abortion and then she can have a second trimester abortion and then she's going to have a stillbirth right so many books say that there is going to be only one abortion they don't even say that there is going to be a first trimester abortion or a second trimester abortion they say there is going to be only abortion once in syphilis some books say that there can be a first trimester and a second trimester abortion but none of them say that it can lead to recurrent abortion so congenital syphilis follows follows kazovitz law and it never leads to recurrent abortions clear this is in quite in contrast to what happens in cervical incompetence in a patient with cervical incompetence as the number of pregnancies increase the period of gestation at which 
the loss happens decreases so suppose if a patient of cervical incompetence had a second trimester abortion initially at first time at 18 weeks then second time she is going to have it at 16 weeks third time she is going to have it at 14 weeks and this is the reason why we say that either you do cervical cerclage between you know 12 to 14 weeks or 2 weeks earlier than previous pregnancy loss clear next question which of the following is incorrect regarding innovation of the uterus so this is a gynae anatomy integration question where they are talking about the uterine innovation sensory level is from t10 to l1 all of you know that uterus is supplied the sensory nerve supplied to the uterus is t10 to l1 via the hypogastric plexus uterine contractility is mediated by innovation from t7 to t8 no uterine contractility is maintained or mediated by hormones uterine contractility is increased by hormones like estrogen prostaglandins and oxytocin whereas it is decreased by progesterone this is the reason why progesterone is used for preventing preterm labor right then in first stage of labor pain is due to fibers at the level of t10 to l1 that's absolutely right in first stage of labor rather in early first stage of labor pain is due to uterine contractions and because it is due to uterine contractions it is mediated by t10 to l1 now once the active phase begins in the first stage then the dilatation of the cervix is happening and then it is also due to dilatation of the cervix and when pain is due to dilatation of the cervix it is because of the sacral plexus and it is the nerve segments which are involved are s2 to s4 in the second stage of labor pain is because of the dilatation of the cervix right but then pain is also because of the stretching of the perineum more so because of the stretching of the perineum and because perineum is supplied by pudendal nerve and pudendal nerve is also you know s2 to s4 so again in the second stage of labor it is mediated by segments s2 to s4 so in first stage of labor in early first stage of labor it is only because of uterine contractions and it is innervated by t10 to l1 then in the the late first stage when the active phase begins and please remember according to who's new guidelines active phase begins at 5 cm so once the cervix is 5 cm dilated then pain is not only because of uh, you know uterine contractions it is uterine contractions and it is dilatation of the cervix what is the application of this the application of this is that if a patient is coming to me for painless labor i am going to give her epidural block and at what level am i going to give her the epidural block i'm going to give her the epidural block at t10 segment clear right so next option in early labor pain is usually because of uterine contractions that's absolutely right now suppose if i ask you that i have to apply forceps or i have to go for an instrumental delivery what is the best uh, anesthesia or analgesia which you can give so we all know that when you are going to apply forceps you are going to stretch the perineum and just now i told you perineum's nerve supply is pudendal nerve which is via s2 to s4 so for applying instruments like for forceps the best thing would be you go for a pudendal nerve block right at what level do you do pudendal nerve block you do it at the level of ischial spines so all of the following statements about anti mullerian hormones are true except it is best tested in a fasting state on day 2 of the menstrual cycle it's a lipopeptide secreted from granulosa cell of the early antral follicle it correlates with pregnancy rate of ivf cycle it decreases the sensitivity of the preantral follicles to fsh now anti mullerian hormone number 1 it's a glycopeptide hormones and this anti mullerian hormone is not only secreted in males it is also secreted in females but the timing is different in males it is secreted in intrauterine in life by sertoli cells and all of you know that in normal sexual development i have taught you this that sertoli cells are going to release anti mullerian hormone and what will be the role of this anti mullerian hormone it is going to lead to regression of the mullerian duct now then i also told you that from puberty onwards in females also it is secreted from the granulosa cells of the preantral and the small antral follicles 
right? And what is their role in these follicles? Why is it secreted in females from puberty onwards? This is because it reduces the sensitivity of these preantral follicles to FSH. We all know that uh, once, you know, hypothalamus releases GnRH, GnRH acts on the anterior pituitary to release FSH. Now, this FSH acts in females on the granulosa cells and from granulosa cells, it releases inhibin. The moment inhibin is released, what is going to happen? It is going to decrease FSH. And it was this FSH which was stimulating the follicles. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. Now, what this anti-mullerian hormone is going to do, it will also be released from these granulosa cells and it is going to, you know, decrease the sensitivity of these preantral follicles to FSH. Because once the FSH levels are going to drop, the follicles are going to undergo atresia. So we just now want, we don't want that atresia to happen at a very early stage and that is why these preantral and antral, small antral follicles, they release this anti-mullerian hormone which helps in follicular development and in oocyte maturation by decreasing the sensitivity of the preantral follicles to FSH. That is the role of anti-mullerian hormone. Now, this is the theoretical role of anti-mullerian hormone. Practically, uh, we also test anti-mullerian hormone. Why? Because just now I told you, these, this anti-mullerian hormone is released by the granulosa cells of the follicle. So, if I want to know in a female or in a couple who has come to me with infertility, whether sufficient number of follicles are present in her ovary or not, I can check for this anti-mullerian hormone. Right? If anti-mullerian hormone levels are normal, that means the number of follicles in the ovary are normal. And if anti-mullerian hormone levels are decreased, that means the number of follicles have decreased. In other words, there is premature menopause. And what is the new name for premature menopause? The new name for premature menopause is primary ovarian insufficiency. So, if I want to know about ovarian reserve, if I want to know whether the number of follicles present in the ovary are sufficient or not, I am going to check for anti-mullerian hormone. What other hormones can I check for ovarian reserve? For ovarian reserve, I can check all those hormones which are released by the ovary. What are the hormones released by the ovary? So, the granulosa cells releases estrogen, right? So, if there is decreased ovarian reserve, estrogen levels will decrease. All of you know estrogen has a negative feedback on FSH. So, if estrogen is decreased, the levels of FSH will increase Right, So, whenever there is decreased ovarian reserve or whenever there is primary ovarian insufficiency, FSH levels are increased. Number three, granulosa cells also release inhibin B. So, the levels of inhibin B will be decreased. Right. Number four, if we on ultrasound, if I will count the number of follicles, that is what is called as antral follicle count. I hope all of you remember that. So, antral follicle count will also be decreased. Among all these tests, the best test is anti-mullerian hormone. Why? Because all these tests, they can be done only in day between day one to day three of the cycle. Whereas anti-mullerian hormone can be done on any day of the cycle, although the best time to do anti-mullerian hormone will also be day 1 to day 3 but you can do it on any day of the cycle clear to all of you so over here i have written for you that anti-mullerian hormone is the best test for ovarian reserve as it can be done on any day although the best time is day 1 to day 3 normal levels of anti-mullerian hormone you should remember they are more than equal to 2 and that is between 2 to 7 if anti-mullerian hormone levels become less than 1 that indicates poor ovarian reserve now see a female who has a premature menopause also comes to you with complaint of secondary amenorrhea, right? And a patient of PCOS also comes to you with a case of as a case of secondary amenorrhea. If I want to distinguish between them, both of them are ovarian causes. How can I distinguish between them? I can distinguish between them by checking the anti-mullerian hormone levels. In case of primary ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause, the levels of anti-mullerian hormone will be decreased because the number of follicles are less in the ovary. 
whereas in case of pcos in pcos there are many uh, you know follicles small follicles that is preantral and anteral follicles that is what is polycystic ovarian syndrome and that is how you diagnose it that you see many small follicles inside the ovary here also i want to bring to your notice that till now the criteria for diagnosis of pcos was the rotterdam criteria said that if there are more than equal to 12 follicles right more than equal to 12 follicles then you said that your patient has pcos now this has been revised to more than equal to 20 follicles so obviously if the number of follicles and that two small follicles in pcos are more so antimalarian hormone levels are high so whenever you have a case of increased antimalarian hormone either it is pcos or it is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome just one more question which i want to tell you over here is that whenever a couple come to you with in fertility there are three tests which you do in all infertile couples i have made you write those tests and that is the three basic investigations which are number 1 serum progesterone on day 22 number 2 hsg and number 3 semen analysis these are three tests which you have to do in all couples so in which couple am i going to check for ovarian reserve what are the indications when i should look for ovarian reserve number 1 if age of the patient is more than equal to 35 years number 2 if she has a family history of poi number 3 if she is a smoker number 4 if she has history of radiotherapy or chemotherapy because all of you know that the most radio sensitive organ in the pelvis is ovary right so if there is history of radiotherapy or chemotherapy then also you should check for ovarian reserve right so over here it is best tested in fasting state on day 2 that's right but it can be done on any day of the cycle it's a lipopeptide hormone no that's a glycoprotein hormone it correlates with pregnancy rate of ivf cycle yes it correlates with pregnancy rate it decreases the sensitivity of the preantral follicles to fsh that's also right clear coming to the next question which is again on infertility a couple already has three children and has been trying for another one for the last one year however husband is diagnosed with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism which of the following is or are true now whether it's my online class or whether it is offline classes whether it's maro or any offline class which i take i always tell you bachcho that these days they ask you questions based on lh fsh and testosterone levels so you should know in all cases cases of secondary amenorrhea what are lh fsh levels in all cases of disorders of sexual development what are lh fsh and testosterone levels and in cases of infertility what are lh fsh and testosterone levels right that's very very important now in order to understand this question i'm going to quickly revise with you you i'm sure you all know this but quickly let us revise the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis now in males from hypothalamus gnrh will be released which is going to act on the pituitary from pituitary fsh and lh will be released fsh is going to act on the sertoli cells and it is going to release inhibin inhibin will have a negative feedback on fsh whereas lh is going to act on the leydig cells to release testosterone this testosterone has a negative feedback on gnrh and main hormone which is needed for spermatogenesis which is occurring in the seminiferous tubules of the testes is testosterone once the spermatogenesis occurs in the testes once the sperms are formed they are going to travel into the male ductal system and then they are going to be ejaculated out so whenever i am doing a semen analysis and i am getting uh, azoospermia i have to think about three major problems the problem could either be in hypothalamus or pituitary which is called as pretesticular problem pretesticular azoospermia or the problem could be in the testes that is called as testicular azoospermia or the problem could be in the uh, ductal system that is called as obstructive azoospermia or that is called as post testicular azoospermia now if it is a test pre testicular azoospermia that means the problem is in hypothalamus or pituitary what will happen to the levels of fsh they will decrease and lh will also decrease so fsh will decrease lh will decrease and obviously testosterone will be decreased right what are the major causes for uh, pre testicular uh, azoospermia number 1 that and this is what is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism number 1 it is kalman syndrome in kalman syndrome what happens in kalman syndrome there is hypothalamic failure and anosmia like we have done kalman syndrome as a cause of female infertility similarly kalman syndrome is also a cause of male infertility please remember that kalman syndrome is more common in males in comparison to females and in males 
also you are going to get hypothalamic failure along with anosmia. Right, so one of the reasons for hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is Kalman syndrome. Number two, it could be any brain tumor or it could be hyperprolactinemia. Why hyperprolactinemia? Because whenever prolactin levels are high, prolactin has a negative feedback on GnRH. Right, so hyperprolactinemia can also lead to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and hypothyroidism can lead to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Right. Then what happens in testicular azoospermia whenever testes is involved? Whenever testes will be involved because hypothalamus and pituitary are normal. But the problem is in testes. So the levels of testosterone will decrease. And because the level of testosterone will decrease, the negative feedback on GnRH will be gone. So the levels of LH and FSH will increase. And that is what is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Causes which lead to hypergonadotropic hypogonadism are are Kleinfelter syndrome that is 47XXY in which there are small hypoplastic testes then mumps orchitis and it is one of the occupational hazards in minors right and there is a small funny story over here in one of my classes I told that in minors there is testicular uh, failure and uh, you know instead of seeing the spelling as M-I-N-E-R-S one of the student wrote M-I-N-O-R-S and that student came to me and asked me ma'am minors testicular failure I said it is M-I-N-E-R-S so please all of you also remember it is M-I-N-E-R-S Right, then there can be post testicular azoospermia. Post testicular azoospermia may the levels of LH, FSH, and testosterone will be absolutely normal. Right, so uh, coming back to our question. Now they are talking to you about hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That means it is a case of pretesticular failure. And if it is a case of pretesticular failure, there will be low LH, FSH, yes. High FSH, low LH? No. There will be oligospermia? Yes. Or azoospermia? Or oligospermia? Low prolactin levels? No. It is high prolactin levels which lead to uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Low testosterone levels? Yes. So the answer is option 1, 3 and 5. Now just a few important points which I want you to remember here. I want you to remember if they ask you what is the most common cause of male infertility, then the most common cause of male infertility is a testicular cause. But if they ask you what is the most common cause of reversible male infertility, then that is varicocele. Whenever the temperature is increased, the scrotal temperature is increased, it leads to decreased sperm count and there is increased in abnormal forms. That is there is teratozoospermia right and necrospermia clear now whenever you are getting hypergonadotropic hypogonadism because one of the causes of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism is Kleinfelter syndrome that is why you should always get a karyotyping done in case of Kleinfelter syndrome, the testes are small and hypoplastic. So tell me what instrument is used for measuring the size of the testes? It is Prader's orchidometer. Right? Clear to all of you? Now, what are the causes of obstructive azoospermia? Causes of obstructive azoospermia is one of the causes is cystic fibrosis because in cystic fibrosis there is congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens and seminal vesicles. Then ejaculatory duct obstruction, varicocele and retrograde ejaculation all these are causes of obstructive azoospermia. A question which was very related to it which was also asked was seminal vesicles and vas deferens would be bilaterally absent congenitally in which of the following conditions that is cystic fibrosis in cystic fibrosis whenever i'm suspecting cystic fibrosis what am i going to do i'm going to check for cftr gene mutation right Kleinfelter's i've told you what it is kalman i've told you what it is cartagenous syndrome what are you going to get cartagenous syndrome is immotile cilia syndrome so over here you are going to get asthenospermia right okay 
Coming to the next question, which of the following statements is false regarding postpartum hemorrhage? Start colloids initially four times the blood loss. Now you tell me, a patient is coming to you with bleeding, with hemorrhage and patient definitely, whenever a patient comes to you with bleeding or with hemorrhage, what is the first step which you do? You go for a resuscitation and when you do a resuscitation, which IV fluid do you give? You give crystalloids, you don't give colloids initially, right? So this is wrong. Primary PPH occurs within 24 hours of childbirth. That's absolutely right. What do you understand by secondary PPH? Secondary PPH means when a PPH happens after 24 hours and up till 12 weeks of delivery. Right? So, up till 12 weeks and after 24 hours. What is the most common cause of primary PPH? It is uterine atony. What is the most common cause of secondary PPH? It is retained product of conception or retained parts of the placenta. PPH is loss of 500 ml of blood in vaginal delivery. That's absolutely right. PPH is uh, loss of more than equal to 500 ml blood loss in vaginal delivery or more than equal to 1000 ml in cesarean section. A very recent definition by ACOG is irrespective of the type of delivery if blood loss is more than equal to 1000 ml then that is what is called as uh, PPH. Now uh, ACOG and WHO they are never in unison with each other. They don't agree with each other. ACOG says blood loss more than equal to 1000 ml in any condition in due to any type of delivery is PPH. WHO says that if blood loss is more than equal to 1000 ml that is what is called as severe PPH. Right, so this option was also right. The causes include retained placenta and atony. That's absolutely fine. So the answer over here is option A. And that was a very easy one. Now comes a little bit which I want to tell you about this question. And that is why I have kept it at last. Recommended HPV vaccination schedule for 9 to 14 years old according to WHO SAGE guidelines. This WHO SAGE guidelines, they came in April 2022. And in May 2022, this question was asked. So you have to know a little bit more about HPV vaccines because there are two things new which have come in HPV vaccine. Number one thing which has come new in HPV vaccine is that in India, India has started manufacturing its own HPV vaccine and it that is what is Sarvavac, which is a quadrivalent vaccine and this is being prepared by the Serum Institute of India in Pune. So please remember, Sarvavac is the first uh, HPV vaccine which is being manufactured in India by Serum Institute of Pune and that's a quadrivalent vaccine. Right. The second thing which all of you, I'm sure you know about it is uh, and that is a general things about HPV vaccine from where are HPV vaccines prepared? They are prepared from L1 capsid proteins. Uh, what are the usual HPV vaccines we study about? We study about Cervirax. We study about Gardasil and Gardasil 9. Cervirax is a bivalent vaccine. Gardasil is a quadrivalent vaccine and Gardasil 9 is a non-avalent vaccine. And uh, this... Uh, Gardasil 9, it protects against 9 HPV strains. These should be on your tips. It protects against HPV 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58. And it protects against all 6 cancers which are caused by HPV. What are the 6 cancers which are caused by HPV? Number 1, it can lead to in females, it can lead to cancer cervix, cancer vagina, cancer vulva. Then in males, it can lead to penis cancer, anus cancer and oral, oral cancers. Right. So these are the 6 cancers which can be caused by HPV and Gardasil 9 is protective against them. What is the ideal time for giving HPV vaccines? 11 to 12 years. Uh, what is the age group at which HPV vaccine is given? It is 9 to 26 years. But then there is an extended age group which has now come which says that if your patient is a high risk patient and gynecologist feels that HPV vaccine has to be given, then it can be given between 27 to 45 years. So in all high risk cases, you can give HPV vaccine even between 27 to 45 45 years. Now, ideally, an HPV vaccine should be given before a female starts sexual activity. And this is a very big confusion which all of you have. Ideally, yes, it should be started before, uh, you know, a female begins her sexual activity. But then, if a female is already sexually active, that is not a contraindication for giving this vaccine. Similarly, if your patient presently has HPV infection or in past she had HPV infection, then that is also not a 
contraindication for giving this vaccine. This is the reason why when we are giving this vaccine, HPV testing is not done. You are not going to do any HPV testing before giving this vaccine. Haan, the only contraindication which you have to remember is a pregnant female. In pregnancy, HPV vaccine is contraindicated. In lactating females, it is not contraindicated. Right, so it is safe during lactation. Most common side effect is syncope. Now coming to the dosage of HPV vaccine. Still now we were studying that in all females who are less than 15 years, you have to give two doses at zero months and then at six months. And if the age was more than equal to 15 years, you are you were giving three doses at zero months, two months and six months. Now uh, the sage recommendations which you have to remember now are, now sage recommendations are that you don't need to give three doses. Three doses are given only if your patient is HIV positive. If your patient is not HIV positive and if age of your patient is 9 to 20 years, you can give one or two doses and if your patient is more than equal to 20 years, you have to give two doses. So this is what is SAGE recommendation and this is what you have to remember from now onwards that between 9 to 20 years, you can give one or two doses. At more than equal to 20 years, you have to give two doses. Three doses are given only only if your patient is HIV positive. Please remember, if you have given HPV vaccine, that doesn't mean that screening should be discontinued. Screening should not be discontinued after giving HPV vaccines. So this is all what I have for you in I I said recall May 2022. Note down all the important points. Not only these points are important, these topics are also important. Uh, see you in the next video that is in NEAT PG 2022 recall. Take care. Bye-bye.